So uh, thank you so much for coming out on this summer evening to hear um, Jim Friedman. I, one of the reasons I so love living in Brattleboro is there are so many people who know so much about so many different subjects. You have and, to introduce me to them one time. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, but they're so generous with what they know, and that's what I'm truly grateful for. So Jim came to me and said, I know a lot about China. There's a lot going on. <laughs> Maybe I could do an update for people. And um, so he offered to do that as a gift to the library community and um, to the, his friends in Women and World Affairs Council. And so this will be a follow-up of the presentation he gave earlier this year uh, for them. So I'm looking forward to, to finding out all that's going on and having a deeper understanding of it. Thanks. Again, my name is Jim Friedman. And, uh, why do I have any credibility to speak to you about China? Um, first of all, uh, my, uh, my history in Brattleboro goes back to 1971, when I came here as a Peace Corps volunteer to the Putney campus of what was then EIL, and you know lived in, from September through January, going through intensive training to get ready to go to Korea and the Peace Corps. And uh, so that, that was my first introduction to Asia. And the story, I, I, at that time I was living just outside Boston. And as part of the Peace Corps preparation process, we had to get fingerprinted. And we had to do an FBI background check. And, and I, I just couldn't find any, anybody to fingerprint me. You know, I didn't. So I went down to the local police station where I lived and I said, I really need to get fingerprinted. They said, would you mind? And they said, no, no, we wouldn't mind at all. So the chief himself brought me downstairs to the processing center and he started to fingerprint me. And, and one of the sergeants came and said, oh, what do he do? He said, I don't know, but they're sending him to Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was my introduction to Asia. And so I, I've been involved in, my involvement with China started in about 2011. I worked in Global Healthcare Administration for a company that specializes in kidney disease. And it's more or less kidneys are us. We did pharmaceuticals, dialysis services, the products, the machines, et cetera. So we're in 86 countries all over the world. And my responsibility was to work in China to what we call localizing the management of the company in China. When, it, when it, any company moves into a new country, they usually bring in expats to start it. And then slowly they turn it over you know, to the locals to run. So my job was over a five year period to find qualified locals, train them, et cetera, to, to run the company both on the sales and production side and services side. So I, my first trip to China was in 2011. And I commuted to China for three years. And then I, I lived in China full time practically from 2014 to 2016, 2017. I lived three years in Shanghai and uh, one year in Hangzhou, which is uh, more or less the Silicon Valley of China. Uh, my wife was a Fulbright Scholar at that time at Zhejiang University, and it, since she was, had a full-time job and I had nothing to do, I enrolled in the International College and studied Chinese and culture while she was teaching. So uh, it, it was a, a very interesting time to be there. So uh, a lot's going on in China. My view of China is a street-level view. When I lived in China, I didn't live in, a, in a, an expatriate community. I didn't have a driver. I didn't do all of the things. Because I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer and had lived in the country and gotten so much out of the country when I lived in Korea, I decided that when I wanted to live in China, I was going to live in China and not view it outside the window of a bus or a car or whatever. So uh, I had an apartment in a very Chinese section of the city, which is not hard to find in Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, ate Chinese food and rode the subway and rode the buses and did everything I could because I knew that my time in China was going to be limited and I just wanted to absorb as much of the culture and the language as I could while I was there. So my observations are based on my street level view. I had some high level views because of my job, but I spent most of my time living in China with Chinese, eating Chinese food, writing Chinese food, and I saw a tremendous um, development over the seven years I was involved in China. So <coughs> one belt, one road. We'll, we'll talk about this. My presentation tonight is to talk about what while we're focused these days on, on North Korea and Korea, and I can speak a little bit about that, um, you know, there's a lot going on in China of which we're not aware. 
And if you only listen to what's coming out of our government these days, you have a very, um, I don't want to say distorted view, a limited view of what's going on in China. Uh, I don't want to make any value judgment. I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. I, I believe in uh, what Harry Truman used to say, he said, I don't give people hell, I just tell them the truth and they think it's hell. <laughs> so I, I just tell you the world as I see it and you can make your own judgments about it. So, one belt, one road. China, m many people's uh, concept of China is, is this China, the old China. The China of the Ming Dynasty, the China. This is in fact the city, the town, where they filmed Crouching Tiger, Hidden, Jack, Hidden Dragon. And, and actually it's become more or less of a tourist destination because of that because of that movie. But it's a very quaint, older older village, you know, not too far from uh, one of the, the fantastic mountain ranges in China just behind it. But the China that you're seeing today is really the China of Shanghai, which is, Shanghai is divided into two sections uh, by a river that runs north-south. It's kind of like Boston, Cambridge. The, the, uh, e the west side of the river, which is called Puxi, is uh, the west side, and it's the older traditional China that you would expect to see. But because Shanghai has been a cosmopolitan city for many years, it's more westernized than most of China. But if you're looking from the west side of the river to the east side of the river, this side of the river was only built in the last 15 years. None of these buildings were there 15 years ago. You know, uh, and, and it's just fantastic. And, and, and they actually, it's more or less an architectural competition. And, and um, I don't want to be seen it politically incorrect, but it's a question of if you can see here, who's is bigger? <laughs> and in fact, this one city over here, this is very, we call that the bottle opener building. <laughs> uh, what happened there, feng shui, some of you know feng shui, which is a Chinese uh, science art about how you position things to make, maintain order in the universe to make sure that qi, which is life force, is flowing properly. They got to the top floors of this building and the local feng shui experts decided that it was disrupting the force. They sensed the disruption in the force. <laughs> and so they decided that there needed to be, you know, a passage through the top of the building so the force could flow and it would be a beneficial result for the people who inhabited this building. Take it quite seriously. You know? and, and at no small expense did they transfer you know, the design to make sure that the bottle opener works properly. So, so we're going to be talking about what China is doing today to move from here, from Hong Sun to Shanghai. So, and also, they have a very different attitude towards their growth. And, and there's no irony intended in this. But when the winds of change blow, some people build walls and others build windmills. The Chinese are rapidly building windmills, you know, while we're wondering where we should build our next wall. Mm. So, make sure we're all on the same page. You've all heard about the Silk Road, but I'm not sure everybody has a, a, a very broad knowledge of the Silk Road, so I want to spend a little time showing you what it was. This was the original, uh, whoops, the original Silk Road is the, the one in red. And it goes from, if I were to go here, Beijing would be up around here. This is a Xinan. You may have seen pictures of Xinan. It's where the terracotta warriors are. Uh -huh. You know, it's that area. And that was really the start of the Silk Road. And the Silk Road really became the, back the backbone of commerce, you know, from 300 BCE, you know, until the present. And, and the trade that went along that road was simply fantastic. You know, Marco Polo went relatively late in time, but there's been a lot of trade going back and forth between China and Central Asia and eventually towards Europe. When, when Marco Polo went, he, he went this way and went overland through the Silk Road and came back this way. So it, it really was the first international commerce, intercultural commerce, and tied very different cultural communities together. I don't know how many of you know uh, the Silk Road Project, which is by the cellist. You know, who put together, which is a combination of musicians from all the cultures represented along the Silk Road. Yo Yo Ma, or in China, he's known as Ma Yo Yo. <laughs> you know, uh, go back and forth, and so 
really it's a fantastic thing that happened and developed over time. And then there were offshoots of the road that went north into Russia that went through the stands, you know, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and up here, and then eventually went into Europe. Now, uh, the original Silk Road went this way. It was the Mongols who went up this way. Uh, when the Mongolians, when Genghis Khan and the Khans went north, they went to Europe. I don't know how many of you know that the Mongols actually negotiated with Charlemagne. You know? Prince. Yes. And they made a deal so he wouldn't invade. <laughs> so Genghis Khan would not invade France. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you a story about that later. So that, that's just about where we are. Now, the th goods that were traded over the Silk Road you know, were, were vast and many. You know, the Europeans sent what they developed east, and the Chinese sent what they developed you know, west and, and in between. And you could make a strong argument, whoop, I'm sorry, I keep on missing that, that the glass beads that we paid for Manhattan <laughs> came from the Silk Road to England and then over to, to North America, if in fact we did do glass beads. I'm thinking that Trump actually brought glass beads back from, <laughs> from Singapore. So anyway, it was a fantastic interchange of commerce over a very long period of time you know, and it was only in the latter part of the 18th century that the Silk Road started to diminish. And that was with the, the input of the Europeans, you know, into the Asian continent where things started to break up and change. So, that's where we are. What's going on today, in terms of this, is China is in the process of rebuilding the Silk Road. Uh, and for, for what I would consider to be obvious reasons not unlike what we did with the Marshall Plan after World War II. They recognize, the, the, the West is no longer a growth market for China. You know, our economies are expanding at two or three percent, and China has a tremendous overcapacity in what they're capable of producing. So they think that they're turning away from being a contract manufacturer and a seller of goods to, from, we are east of China, to us, and they're starting to work on developing their markets to the west of them, which is Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and going back towards Europe. So the One Belt, One Road project is not just establishing a, a, an avenue for trading of goods, it's a project for developing the markets. So the future markets that they will be selling to will be in Central Asia and going towards Europe, very much like the Marshall Plan we did. So One Belt, One Road. So yi dai yi lu. Now, One Belt, One Road has actually more involved than you might think at first. There are 67 countries now involved in the development of the Silk Road. I don't think many people know that. Wow. And one, one Belt is the overland route. One Road is the maritime version. Road is a, also a nautical term. Have you heard of the Hampton Roads you know, in Virginia where the main ships go out into the Atlantic? So the road situation. And there's also a third component, which is the cyber Silk Road. They're building an, an internet backbone for all of Central Asia and Southeast Asia that connects them with China. Now, if you've heard or read anything about what's going on in China in terms of the internet, you know, it's a little spooky <laughs> to be considered that they will be providing the backbone network for all of Central, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and North Asia, right? And, and even though the Great Wall of China really doesn't exist anymore, when I lived there, we experienced the great firewall of China every day. They really make an attempt to control access, you know, to all kinds of internet um, and social media through their great firewall of China. Now, the interesting part of that is, how many of you here know what a VPN is? A VPN? A virtual private network. It's a way of penetrating security, legally. You know, you can drill through and create security holes through things. So almost every kid under 30 has a VPN on their computer and has total access to Google, email, and all the things that they're not supposed to have access to. Mm -hmm. And China is okay with that. China has no problem saying we have control of the internet, but in fact, they just turn a blind eye to what's going on with the younger generation. So you can't really control uh, that kind of media. So it, this is what's going on. And it, it's, it's really extending over a large area. So you can see where the original road started, Xi'an, went up through Urumqi and Bishek and went through Central Asia all the way to Belgium. And, and when Marco Polo went, 
overland, he went that way. Actually, when Marco Polo came back, he came back by the sea route. Uh, I don't think everybody knows that, that Marco Polo was also a seafarer. And then when he came back, he didn't just go overland because it took him, if my history, it took him approximately seven to 10 years to go overland from Italy mm -hmm. to Xi'an. And it took him a good deal less time to come back. But he stayed in China for quite a while, building the connections in order to, to facilitate the, the commerce with um, Eastern Europe and Western Europe at that time. So that's the old Silk Roads in red, the Maritime Silk Roads in blue, that existed then. And now we're going to be looking at the new Silk Roads that are under development <coughs> right now. So uh, the one that's most well built right now is this one that goes through China, Pakistan. This one goes into Thailand and Vietnam, which are on border with China, you know, and then this one goes up through Russia and goes into Eastern Europe, and now is connected over actually into the British Isles, you know, through shipping and whatever. And I can show you how that works. So, so <coughs> right now, uh, in about 2021, you'll be able to take a fast train from Bangkok to Beijing. And when we talk about high-speed rail, and we're talking about high speed rail, not the Acela. You know, the China has more high speed rail today combined than the rest of the world, right? And it really does go at high speed. So, so this, the the One Belt part of this is mostly rail because it's mostly there to facilitate commerce. There's not much passenger traffic going back and forth right now, but it will facilitate that. So. It'll be the longest rail, railroad in the world when it finishes. It used to be the Trans-Siberian was the longest, but the one that will go from Beijing to London, which is right in development right now, uh, is going to be fantastic and at high speed. So this is what's going on. These are the countries which are now participating with China in the One Belt, One Road project. Uh, and, and um, you know, when you talk about Trump wanting bilateral deals. He doesn't like multilateral deals. You know, China has no problem with multilateral deals. You know, and so coordinating the activities and being the principal source of commerce and internet traffic by being the provider of services to all these countries, many of which don't have them now or don't have a good one, is going to have a unifying uh, influence on the markets that will now become more um, involved and engaged with China than it will be with the West, right? It's an important concept to realize. So how are they financing this, the Belt Road Initiative? So China has committed in the next 10 years 1.4 trillion to the initiative. Credit Suisse uh, estimates that China could invest over 500 billion to 62 projects over the next five years. They're going big time <laughs> into this. You know, and, and the interesting parts of this are, for me, the market that they're going to be covering, 4.4 billion people, you know, and a gross domestic product of $21 trillion per year, you know. And, and if you look at a point of comparison, to see China's infrastructure is 9% of their GDP, and ours is on average 2% of our GDP which is why it took them such a long time to finish the bridge over 91. <laughs> so uh, it's, we are, while we are being distracted with what's going on in North Korea, while we have two carrier groups in the East Sea, uh, we're spending a lot of money uh, over there. China, it's, it's like China's playing, it's like David Copperfield, you know, the magician, you know. You look over here while I trick you over here. All right? So it's a diversionary tactic to keep us uh, distracted. And there's nothing that you read in the news media. You really have to dig information to find out what's going on about this kind of information. We have a problem. The next war that we fight is not going to be a land war. It's a trade war. And the Chinese know that. And they're way ahead of us right now in terms of what they're doing. So uh, this is just gives you an idea of the, the, the One Belt, One Road project was actually conceived in 2011, but not formally announced until 2014. And actually, for those of you who are Hillary fans, uh, Xi Jinping credits Hillary Clinton 
was stimulating the, the concept of rebuilding the One Belt, One Road project. So you could use that on Jeopardy and win a million dollars. <laughs> so and, and some of it is outright funding and some of it is just M&A deals in, in terms of what's going on in terms of funding the project. What's yep. M&A? A merger and acquisition. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So, uh, you know, you've heard of the World Bank and you've heard of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which many of the poor countries of the world use to fund their infrastructure development. China, in 2015, founded what they call the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And, and what they're using is this as a vehicle so all of these countries can invest and provide a pool of funds for those countries who want to be involved in the One Belt, One More project. So it's essentially a huge world loan fund uh, that China is using, China is controlling, in order to fund the investments and the development of the infrastructures in all of these countries. So it, it, the founding members were 57, and now the leading country is China. So it's, it's again, while we're, we're concerned with uh, the importation or you know, exportation of milk to Canada, <laughs> you know, uh, which, by the way, is 0.3% of our trade with Canada, is, is uh, there's a lot going on on the other side of the Atlantic that we should be more concerned about. So, and this is just an example of some of the projects in the last year that are underway as, as part of the One Belt, One Road project, because again, it's not just, you know, it's about promoting commerce, and it's about promoting the development of those countries which are yet in a living standard where they can afford to do much trade with China, but China has a long game. They're playing a long game. They're not playing checkers. They're playing Chinese chess, a long game in terms of their development. So even some of the fund they're using to develop the Beijing Air Quality Improvement Project. So many of you have, have seen or heard on TV how bad the air is in Beijing, right? How many have heard that story? Yeah. It's fake news. <laughs> yeah, it's been, there are in fact you know some days in Beijing where the pollution is just terrible but most days it's not and the Chinese in the last seven years have made tremendous progress in terms of cutting down their air pollution and one of their national goals is by 2025 all of the major cities along the coast Beijing, Qingdao, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Jiamen will all have only allowed electric cars Oh, and 50% of all the electric cars sold in the world today are sold in China to Chinese. So they are good at ramping up, you know, on a very grand scale. Their current population is 1.4 billion. Our population is roughly 3 point, uh, 350 million. So in a country four times the size of ours, they have resources that when they focus and concentrate, they can move very quickly and accomplish some amazing things. But you can also see that they're spending their money, you know, in North Africa, in Central Europe, and along and around the Indian Ocean. The important thing to note here is the amount of money they're spending in the Indian Ocean. Why is that important? Oh, um, by the way, this is just another way of financing. I, wanted, I just found this slide today and I thought I'd throw it in and explain to you what's going on. Chinese funding, when they first came out of the Cultural Revolution, and by the way, my friend Tim Maciel, is that Tim, Tim and I were in Peace Corps training together. We went to Korea together. Uh, and we went through SIT in, in 1971. Tim spent a longer time in Korea than I did. And also, Tim took the high road. He went and got a doctorate at Harvard, and I went into business. So whenever we have a beer together, he always takes the moral high ground. Yeah. <laughs> and who's, who's giving the lecture now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, the, just in you know the development of Chinese financing, how does how does China how does China finance its growth? You know, and in the 1980s it was all through R and D institutes and universities. Then they went into Chinese bank, were the main source of funds. You know, then they went they developed these local technology zones, and then Chinese venture capital firms, and then foreign venture capital firms, and government venture funds. China has a remarkable way of funding that is, is incomprehensible, I think, to most of us. And that is, the largest venture capital fund that's currently run in China is run by the People's Liberation Army. Right? So, government-funded venture capital 
in a capitalist society sounds like an oxymoron. How can you have government-funded venture capital? But that's how they grow. You know, people like uh, Jack Ma, the president of Alibaba, which is now on the American Stock Exchange, they had Alibaba and some other, you know, large-scale, you know, internet projects. You don't get to be a billionaire in China without cooperating with the government. So, 60% of all the businesses in China are state-owned. State-owned, and I mean, hotels, motels, you know, what you and I would consider to be private businesses are state-owned there. So one of the nicest hotels in downtown Shanghai is a state-owned, so it's like staying in the post office. <laughs> if you want to translate that into an American, an American concept, but the services are very good, and people understand that's the way it is. 20% of the businesses in China are run by what they call collectives, which are communes, some of which still exist in West Brattleboro, not too far from where I live. <laughs> you know, uh, but they're still very related and influenced by the government. And about 20% is something that you and I might recognize as private enterprise, but it's really not. Because most of the funding comes from the government, and again, nothing happens in China without the central uh, communist Chinese party having you know, uh, their finger in it somehow. You know, it's a very different way of doing it. So now China has become so rich that they have government venture capital funds and they have Chinese angel investors. Yeah, are you familiar with the concept of an angel investor? I know I'm not dealing with the business community here, but if, you, if I wanted to start a business here in Brattleboro and I needed money, first thing I might do is go to the bank and the bank might laugh at my business plan. And then I might go to the small business development program and then I might get a chuckle. You know? And then I might go out to friends and family and see who would contribute. But at some point, I'm gonna need money to develop. And so if I'm not sophisticated enough to go to the big guys, the venture capital funds, then I go to someone with money who might be interested in investing in what I do. And they call them angel investors. So right now, Shanghai, uh, itself has more millionaires than there are in New England, one city, you know, and, and it's easy to understand because the population of Shanghai is 28 million, and I don't know what the population of New England is, but it's not anywhere near 28 million. And, and the other thing is that, and we're talking about the scale of China versus us, we have six cities in the United States with populations of more than 5 million. China has 45. So, so it's just a very different scale of operation when you go there. So, so anyway, the, the government funding these days is coming from government venture funds and Chinese angel investors. And the Chinese angel investors have also now set up offices in California and Silicon Valley. <laughs> and 35% of all the venture capital that's being spent in the United States to help new startup firms is not coming from the United States. It's coming from Chinese investors. And then they're, when they get to be big enough and, and, and um, operating at a, at a certain scale, then China says, don't pay for real estate in California. We've got this nice industrial park in Shenzhen or Shanghai or Beijing or Tianjin, and we'll help you out. So, so there's a lot going, and, and tariffs don't cover that. You can't protect venture capital with tariffs. So when did we know this was happening? Well, Obama did. Uh, for those of you whose memory extends back beyond the current state of affairs, uh, <laughs> Obama, you know, talked about the Asian pivot. When he decided that we were spending too much time and attention in Western Europe, and we needed to spend more time and attention in, in getting involved in more of what was going on in Asia. And, it, and that's when the concept of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, started to come about. Because he realized, and the government realized at that time that we were woefully understaffed and woefully under, um, we're woefully ignorant about what was really going on in that side of the world because we were so focused on what was going on here and in Afghanistan and Iraq and the Middle East and Syria and all that. We were distracted. And the Chinese were very happy that we were distracted. So anyway, the United States worries that China will use the bank to set the global economic agenda in its own terms with disregard to human rights, disregard to corruption, disregard to almost anything, that when we go and fund a project, when I say we, the United States government goes in to fund a project, we have a lot of contingencies that tax that money. You can use this money if, and when, and but. China doesn't have any problem. You know, 
they're almost like the guy in the street corner saying, you need five bucks? <laughs> so so it's, it's a very different mentality. Now, most of you probably don't know that Gene Roddenberry studied Chinese. Gene Roddenberry was the writer who wrote all of the Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> And, and Jean-Luc Picard was the captain of the Starship Enterprise, which is Star Trek Next Generation. But they, they called the prime directive as not just a set of rules, it's a philosophy and a very correct one. History has proved again and again that whenever mankind interferes with less developed civilization, no matter how well-intentioned that interference may be, the results are invariably disastrous. And why did I say Roddenberry studied Chinese? Because over a thousand years ago, the Chinese developed their five principles of peaceful coexistence, which is mutual respect for each other's territory, integrity, mutual non-aggression, mutual non-interference, equality, cooperation, mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. Right? And, and by the way, this is the basis for Kim Jong-un's approach to negotiation. This is what he wants. And this is what China has been advising him that this is what he wants. Mm -hmm. You know, 90% of all the commerce into North Korea is coming from China. And it was no accident that when Kim Jong-un flew into, into Singapore last week, he flew on Air China. Air China provided him with two planes for his transportation. One is a decoy and one is a real plane. When you know that, when you deal in Asia, and you, you have to understand very quickly, nothing happens by chance, nothing happens by accident, especially at that level. Who do you suppose was advising Kim Jong-un on his way to Singapore? And who do you suppose was debriefing him on his way back to North Korea while he's riding on Air China? Take a wild guess. <laughs> They're probably Chinese. Yeah, so, and, and this is what China wants, this is what North Korea wants, this is what most of the Asian countries want. They, we'll give you money, we'll work with you, we'll do anything you want, but don't tell us how to run our government, and we won't tell you how to run yours. This is what they're looking for. It's a very different philosophy than we have when we're talking about foreign aid. So, we talk about the development of projects and, and how China is not only investing in its own infrastructure, but China is investing in the infrastructure of the other countries in Central and Southeast Asia. And for example, here in, in Pakistan, they've developed you know, the seaport, the main seaport now in Pakistan is in Gwadar. Now, they lent a lot of money to, uh, to, the, to the Pakistanis to develop the port at a very reasonable interest rate. You know, not bad at all, really. But it wasn't long before the Pakistanis realized that they couldn't pay it back. And oh, by the way, when China goes in to develop these areas, they don't use local labor. They bring in Chinese labor to build the seaports, and it's managed by Chinese. So China, I give Tom, Tom French here, one of my neighbors, I give Tom a hundred million dollars and then he pays my laborers a hundred million dollars to build you know the infrastructure that they wanted to build anyway and then you know Tom runs out of money he can't pay me back so I said don't worry Tom I'll take over the port I'll run it for you <laughs> right this is what's happening all over Asia right now and and China and Africa too. In Africa too, and in Latin America, they just and had to deal with Venezuela and Ecuador. Yeah. And in Greece. And in Greece, uh, they yes. I heard that kids in school in Portugal now are learning Chinese. Yes. Because there's so many Chinese workers in Portugal, so it's well, happening. Well, not only for that reason, but it's true. <laughs> they're they're all over the and so. But if you look at the, the legend on the stock. Dual use. So, so when China went into Pakistan and said, you can't pay a support, and by the way, you won't mind if our Navy stops in and uses the seaport from time to time, would you? <laughs> no, no, they don't mind at all. And so, uh, and they did the same thing with Djibouti, the same thing with the Seychelles. They've got a, an agreement going on in Piraeus. This no. the South China Sea, you know, you've heard about they're dredging the ocean and building the islands, you know, and they're building in here. We've got a, a possible contract with Darwin in Australia. So what they're doing here is they're opening up in, you know, China, again, is somewhat cut off from the Pacific because of, of our infrastructure there. But there's no one really operating in the Indian Ocean. It's a vast ocean. There's a lot of money to be made. China wants access. Now, why did they put it here? You can see 
see this, this is called the Straits of Malacca. Some of you may have heard it. It's only 40 miles wide at its widest. 40% of all the world's shipping, all the world's shipping goes through the Straits of Malacca. And, and the fact that China put its naval base at the entrance to the Straits of Malacca is not accidental. It's not accidental. Now, we have naval bases and we have naval agreements now with Vietnam, with Singapore, with Thailand, with Manila, you know, all throughout that area for the same reasons. We are very concerned about protecting our interests. And so China is saying to the world, hey, you know, the United States has naval bases all over the world. All we're doing is building one naval base to protect our interests in this area of the world. And by the way, 40% of the trade goes through here, so why wouldn't we be able to build here? And it's, for, for them, it's benign. For us, it seems aggressive, <laughs> you know. But, but their way of doing business is, you know, no worries, you can't pay us back. <coughs> We'll run it for you. And by the way, they made a bid to operate the port of Los Angeles. They made a bid to operate ports in Saudi Arabia. They're operating ports in Latin America right now. There's all kinds of things, and they're, they're building highways in Africa. The main constructors of highways are the Chinese in Africa. They just signed an agreement with uh, Venezuela owes them $10 billion. And because of what's going on in Venezuela, it's very unlikely to be paid. China is saying, no worries. You know, we'll come in and we'll do some things for you and we'll just work with you on this project. So it's like the camel getting its nose under the tent, right? It's how they do business. But they don't, they're not concerned if it happens next year or two years or three years. They're playing five, 10 years, 15, 25, 100 years. They're okay with that. They have a long game. You know, I, I, I'm, again, I'm principally concerned that our current leadership has adult onset ADHD. <laughs> You know, that I don't know if he has the patience, you know, to sit and talk for long periods of time and hold one thought that they can, he can play this kind of negotiation with China. So, so this is an area of concern, and I think part of the reason why we should be concerned is about the One Belt Room project. Jim, who is, who's the big player here? China. The person. G, oh, well, I'll get to that. Okay. Hold, hold on to that. I, I'm coming to that. So. Uh, these are things we should be concerned about. Now, I told you about the connection. Uh, Yi Wu is, is just south of, of Beijing. In January 2017, a freight train went from China, China all the way to London. You know, it's it really the opening up of that one belt, one road trade route. Right. And if one train can go, many trains can go, and they will, and they will. So, and right now, most of this, up to here, it's high-speed rail. Then it goes through some of these rails. And one of the reasons China wants to improve the rail system in these countries is to improve access to those countries. Now, I know there are some people in the room who remember why Eisenhower built the interstate highway system. Yep. Why? <laughs> because when he went to Germany, he observed that the Germans could move their troops really fast. <laughs> so, so if you're building, you know, rail access, and you're building highway access, and you're building maritime access, you know, with seaports, again, with protected seaports all the way that are Chinese for refueling, etc., you know, in, 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 a, in a benign way, sure, they're going to improve commerce. It's going to improve, improve access to commerce. The, the, these nations in Central Europe and Central Asia, their economies are going to raise. There's no question about that. And the main beneficiary, like we were the main beneficiary of the Marshall Plan, the main beneficiary of One Belt Run Road, is not necessarily going to be those countries. South Vietnam is not going to benefit all that much from this, but China's going to benefit a whole bunch. Now, why is that a problem for us? Well, this is part of the problem. By the way, this is the high-speed rail. This is the new rail station in, in Beijing. And, and uh, I rode on this train. And it goes very fast. 300 kilometers per hour. Yeah, 301 kilometers per hour. That's, every car has a speedometer, so you can see how fast you're going the whole time. <laughs> now, when they talk about, and that translates to, to what, 180 miles an hour? And so it, it, I went from Shanghai to Beijing, which is about 800 miles, it took me five and a half hours. Now, the Acela, our high-speed rail, 
on a good day with the wind behind it <laughs> goes from Boston to New York in three and a half hours, which is 200 miles. So, so the, the, the Chinese train would be two-thirds of the way to Beijing in the same period of time. So they're not fooling around. You know, they're not fooling around. And, and can you just imagine how long it would take us to get the permits to build a high-speed rail? <laughs> you know, it, it would be, it, it's enormous. So I, I was saying earlier to some people I met here earlier that, that when China decides they want to do something, they do it. They do it. Eminent domain, the concept of eminent domain has a whole different meaning in China. You know, Tom, we think you should move. <laughs> you know, and Tom says, brilliant, good idea. I was going to move. Thank you very much. They take good care of their people. They move them well. But there's not a lot of discussion or negotiation that goes on once they decide to do something. And I also was saying before, China does a really good job with what we facetiously call satellite projects. If you can see it from a satellite, they can do it really well. The Three Gorges Dam is observable, you know, the high-speed rail system. Some of what they're doing now in terms of industry, you know, solar farms like you can't believe, you can see them from satellites. They're not so good at small-scale projects, but they're really good at large-scale projects, and they move very fast. And they've got a huge concentration of brain power and manpower to get things done. So, I'm going to go back two years to the Trans-Pacific Partnership and why the Trans-Pacific Partnership would have been important to us, even if it wasn't necessarily economically a good idea, although we could argue that. Uh, the initial signatories to the Trans-Pacific Partnership were those countries outlined in red, and, and the Trans-Pacific because they all border you know, on the Pacific. China was not a part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we had 11 economic partners that were 90% of the way to signing an economic uh, pact that would have had great influence for us in China and in that part of the world. And these are some of the numbers that I picked off off the internet, you know, from, from this. So 12 countries, 24% of the world trade, 36% of the world GDP, uh, you know, and some of the tariffs that we would have lost. So 100% of manufactured goods on which all tariffs would eventually be eliminated. So, you know, Trump's argument about tariffs would have been a non-argument, right? And, and what Trump decided to do was instead of having a multilateral deal with these countries, which was all ready to go, he decided that he wants a bilateral deal with each individual country. Well, they're not interested. <laughs> and by the way, if you start to negotiate bilateral deals, it took three years to negotiate the TPP to get to the point of signing. You go back to the beginning again and go talk to Malaysia, talk to Australia, you know, talk to Korea. How long will it take you? We don't have enough manpower to negotiate that many deals simultaneously. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. But so, more than just an economic partnership, this was a chance to exercise our influence, you know, our projection of the United States' influence into this part of the world. You know? So, uh, I know that there's a lot of attention being paid to, to Trump's relationship with Putin these days and what kind of collusion, what went on. Trump's real best friend, although he doesn't know it, is Xi Jinping. No one in the world has benefited more from Trump's presidency than Xi Jinping, the president of China. And it's mostly because of what Trump hasn't done or refused to do. When, when Trump pulled out of, the, T, of the, the, the Paris Agreement, guess who stepped in to take the leadership role? China. When, when they pulled out of the TPP, China stepped in right away, you know, with the Regional Commission on Economic Partnership, and also with his, the One Belt, One Road project. And, and when these countries are nervous about what their relationship with the states are going to be, well, you know, China's saying, hey, you know, come to us. You know, we'll give you the money, we'll help you develop, and we won't have any of the problems that you had in terms of human rights and corruption and those other things. You just we won't have the problem with those things. You just have to be able to do this. So, so the, the, the members of the TPP decided, you know what, maybe we can live without the United States. So the other 11 members of the TPP decided in November 2017 at the APEC summit where Trump was there, <coughs> decided to go ahead and sign it as an, make an agreement anyway. Now I said before, nothing happens in Asia by chance, you know. They, they were there to say, you know, 
we can live without you. We can live without you. And so, in March of this year, just you know, two months ago, those member nations signed the TPP and are already actively participating in this kind of trade development from those economic partnerships that exist. And before, you know, China was not a part of it. Now America's not a part of it, but these people all exist within missile range of Beijing. You know, they don't have missiles, Beijing does. And so they can't afford to be without a big brother. If the United States is not gonna be the big brother, then we're almost forcing them into an agreement to work with China because they have no alternative. They have no alternative. So when I say that Xi Jinping is Trump's, Trump has done more for Xi Jinping than he ever could have hoped to have done for Putin, it's because of we stepped out of the Asian market by withdrawing from all these agreements. Now, now Napoleon, some of you aren't old enough to remember Napoleon, but I read about him, you know, said, uh, when you see your enemy making a mistake, don't interrupt him. <laughs> so uh, I have friends who work in the Chinese media who have been told every time Trump makes a mistake or does something which benefits China, you almost never read about it. They, play, they downplay it in the Chinese media because they don't want to, you know, to, to let him know that we've really benefited a lot from this. And the, so they play it down. And, and even in this, uh, what happened in the last two days, if you look at the Chinese media in the last two days, and I read some Chinese media, they said virtually nothing about this, except that you will remember, some of you will remember that, I think it was last January, December, Chinese recommended to the United States and North Korea, look, you freeze your missile program, and the United States will stop its war games. Do you remember that? Yes. They suggested that last fall. You know, and Trump said, no way. <laughs> That's a disaster. You know, so, and now what did we end up with as of yesterday? We agreed. <laughs> you know, or they're, they're going to freeze their, they're going to no, work towards work toward it, yeah. you know, freezing their missile program, and we're going to immediately stop our war games. And the next iteration of the war games was actually going to be in August. So they've already they've already said no, no more August war games. So what did we get? As they say in New York, bupkis. <laughs> <laughs> so the mandate of heaven. So this is a, an ancient Chinese principle, which means that that every leadership, every all the dynasties from the Zhou dynasty, you know, up to the last dynasty of China, the Qin dynasty, which ended at about 1910, that they look from the blessings from heaven. If things were going well, we had the blessing from heaven. We had Tianming, and so. Every Chinese leader is a scholar of history, and they know very well what the mandate of heaven means. It means you have the blessing from above, and, and that means the people are benefiting from that, and so we're secure in our leadership. Chinese has never, the Chinese have never had a, a, a hereditary dynasty system like the West has had. You know, leadership doesn't necessarily pass because you belong to a certain family. Leadership passes because you benefit the people. And if, you, if the, you don't benefit the people, then the people will change you. So they've had thousands of years of relatively rapidly changing governments until more recent times. So it's an important concept. So this was developed in the Zhou Dynasty. It's used to justify unified China under one ruler. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. And the mandates decides whether an emperor is virtuous enough to rule. Virtue is a big deal in China. It's a big deal in China. They define it somewhat differently than we do. But, but a virtuous person in China is one who will defer his individuality to the benefit of the group. Their primary value is group harmony and group stability. Right? So if I'm a member of a family, I will not exercise my individuality unless it benefits the group. Right? Everything is for the benefit of the group, the benefit of the family, the benefit of my region, the benefit of the state, the benefit of the government. And, and when I were teaching last year in China, and I'm going back to teach this summer in Beijing, you know, I, and I was there, by the way, during the Trump election, which was very hard to explain <laughs> to my Chinese colleagues. Uh, on the day of the election, there's a 12-hour time difference between Boston and Shanghai and Hongzhou. And, and so 10 o'clock in the evening here, which is when the election went south, from my perspective, uh, was 10 o'clock in the morning there. I was teaching a Chinese class at that moment and I had my, my earbud in one ear listening to the election results, you know, because I, I just, it was too important not to know. And so when, when I heard that Hillary had conceded about 10 o'clock, 
I just inadvertently let out with a holy shit. <laughs> and the front row of Chinese speakers who speak English very well had heard the word holy before, and certainly had heard the word shit, but they weren't familiar with the concept of the juxtaposition of those two words. <laughs> so uh, and during the break, I explained to them my concern. But they, they, they don't understand. Most of the world doesn't understand how we got to be rulers. So and finally, if the emperor doesn't fulfill his ruling obligations, he loses the mandate, and he loses the right to rule, and the government changes. So uh, this was at Mar El Lago last year when, when uh, Xi Jinping became Trump's best friend. <laughs> Trump said so, but in fact, if you look at the benefits that passed to Xi Jinping, it's really true. So, in terms of office, uh, Xi Jinping started as president and chairman of the Central Communist Chinese Party in uh, 2012, and they, they run on five-year terms in China. And they don't often get continued. They usually get cut after five years, and the next one comes along. Howsomever, because of his ability to influence the Chinese government, he was not able to get reelected in 2017. He got the Constitution of China, which is different from our Constitution by a whole bunch, to, to be changed to no term limits. He can now stay president of China as long as he wants. And part of the reason he was able to do that, because in 2012, 2017, he also became su supreme commander of the People's Liberation Army. Now, the United States, you know, the president who has always been the commander in chief, it, but, uh, but there's the separate Congress, the legislative branch, and the you know, judicial branch. He was able to unify, during his first term, all of, those all of those sections of the government under his control, which is why he was able to influence the government and say, wouldn't it be a great idea if I stayed as your president for quite a long time? And, and of course, because group harmony is important, they all said, brilliant idea. That's a good idea. So, and, and, and his big deal, he talks about the Chinese dream. And it's really a variation of make America great again. He wants to make China great again. But he doesn't want to make China great again from 1950 or 1960 or 1970. He wants to go back to a thousand years when China really was, you know, the dominant empire in the world, you know, about 900 to 1300, when they literally controlled the world. And not only controlled the world because of, of um, the Chinese dynasties, but because the Mongols unified you know, the Chinese government just about during that period. And, and I said I'd tell you a quick story. Uh, last year I visited Chongqing, which is in southwest China, which is the home of Deng Xiaoping, who really was responsible for opening up China's commerce to the West. And, and uh, the Mongols in the 1100s had gotten as far west as France, had gotten as far southwest as Syria, you know, had gotten as far east as Japan and Manchuria and, and really commanded a whole bunch of areas. They hadn't got into southern China. They, from Chongqing south and from Hangzhou south, they hadn't been able to penetrate southern China, which was the Qin Dynasty at that time. There was a, there was a confluence of rivers in Chongqing that come together at a very strategic point. And there's a fort that sits above the river that's about 2.5 miles square. And it's a self, it has agriculture, it has water, it has everything you need. So for a period of over 75 years, the, Song, the Southern Song Dynasty soldiers who inhabited that fort were able to hold off the Mongol horde for 75 years. Right? No one had ever held back the Mongols for that period of time. The Mongols were not Chinese. The Mongols were racially a different people. And, and so what happened there, there, at that time, Genghis Khan had already died, and there were, three, there were three cousins. There was Kublai Khan, who at that time was living in Hangzhou. There was Monga Khan, who was um, uh, in, in Chongqing. And there was Ogle Khan, who was in Western Europe. Monga Khan got killed during one of the sieges of the fort, right? And, and when they, the Khans, when they elect who's going to be the next ruler of the Khans, they have to have a big meeting. They have to call everybody back. And so since there was going to be a competition between Kublai Khan and Ublai Khan to be the next great Khan, you know, Ublai Khan had to withdraw his armies from Europe and come back to China 
And Kublai Khan had to withdraw his armies from northern China and come back, and they had to have this big meeting and decide you know, who was going to be the leader. It turned out to be Kublai Khan, who then you know, made uh, Hongzhou his capital. Now, why is that important? Because the Mongols were at the point of conquering all of Western Europe. And had it not been for this one fort in Chongqing, which held back the Chinese invasion for 75 years, we might all be speaking Chinese. <laughs> I'm serious. It really was one of those quirks of history. And the name of the fort is called the Dao Yu Chong, which means fishing fort. <laughs> because before there was a fort there to, to hold off the Mongol invasion, it was just a fishing village. It was like Gloucester saved the empire. <laughs> so, I mean, it's one of the, I, I, I like trivia. So, but anyway, the Chinese dream is to turn China back a thousand years to a time when it was the preeminent empire in the world. And, and the name for China in, in Chinese is Zhonghua, which means the central empire. Now, it, it has had several connotations about what that actually means. It means the center of the, of the world in terms of the the geographical center of the world because the world revolved around China. But to the Chinese, it also means the passage to heaven. It's the China is the central kingdom that separates earth from the heavens. And all of the emperors of China have been known as the sons of heaven, sons of the dragon, sons of heaven. So he's talking about a whole different kind of return to greatness than I think Trump is talking about because I'm still wondering which decade he's talking about when he says make America great again. <laughs> so, uh, leadership experience, 1983, he started as governor of Zhejiang province. He's had a lot of experience governing large numbers of people and exercising his influence. He's a very remarkable guy. He was also a victim of the Cultural Revolution. During the Cultural Revolution, his father was a, was a, a university professor and he and his family were all sent for re-education, you know, during the Cultural Revolution. So he spent seven years, you know, working as a farm, working as a peasant. He also was very highly educated at Beijing University. So he's got this, you know, man of the people. He really was a man of the people, and he really has a high education. So he's a very clever, uh, very highly trained man. You don't rise up in the Communist Party without that. Um, our current leader, you know, could be in office until 2020. When I say till 2021, because you know he doesn't turn over office until January 20th, you know, uh, 2021, and, and who knows he could be reelected. Uh, but his leadership experience is limited to a year and a half, more or less, and make America great again. So it's a whole different way of looking at the world. So at the World Economic Forum two years ago, this is what Xi Jinping had to say: Many of the problems troubling the world are not caused by economic globalization. Right. And by the way, that's a very Republican sentiment. <laughs> Free trade. You know, this is what Donald Trump said last year. When a country is losing many billions of dollars on trade with virtually every country it does business with, trade wars are good and easy to win. When we are down $100 billion with a certain country and they get cute, don't trade anymore, we win big. It's easy. I don't, Wharton School, really? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think he must have been standing behind the door during Economics 101, because Milton Friedman would be spinning his brain. So uh, I, I put this up there just as a, as a way of uh, a juxtaposition. The Cato Institute, by the way, is a very libertarian think tank in Washington, D.C., funded by the Koch brothers, which a name you might recognize along with Mercer. You know, very Republican, very conservative, and they say this. The first myth is that all overall U.S. trade deficit is caused by unfair trade barriers abroad. The most conservative think tank in the United States, you know, don't buy, you know, this trade war business at all. And in fact, they say if trade deficits are bad for growth, why does the U.S. economy grow more than 50% faster when the trade deficit expands? You know, trade deficits don't cause problems for us. Trade deficits are good. Now, I'm sure there are some people in Washington who would disagree with me, but I, I find myself, you remember when Groucho and Mark said I wouldn't join any club that would have me as a member? <laughs> when I find myself sympathizing with the Cato Institute and the Cokes, I think I'm good. <laughs> the world has really turned upside down. So, oh, want to get to this. 
how the State Department has changed. Under John Kerry, the Department's mission is to shape and sustain a peaceful, prosperous, just, and democratic world and foster conditions for stability and progress for the benefit of the American people and people everywhere. The current State Department mission statement says, the U.S. Department of State advances the interests of the American people, their safety and economic prosperity, by leading Americans' foreign policy through diplomacy, advocacy, and assistance, right? And it, it's just a dramatic change in philosophy. You know, Kerry and, and before him, even Bush, said a rising tide raises all ships. You know, if we all do well, we'll all do well together and the world will be a better place. Not exactly what Tillerson and Pompeo and Trump have in mind. How does that affect the world? So, three pillars of geopolitical strategy are diplomacy, direct aid, which is direct foreign aid to those countries that need it, and defense, All right? So, so you, you, the mind goes where you spend your money. So this is the, the budget that Trump put forth here, right? You can see environmental protection got a 31% cut. The U.S. State Department got a 30%, a 29% cut. You know, $55 billion 2017 to $37 billion in 2018, right? And the Defense Department got a 10% increase. So how is our geopolitical strategy changing, right? It's changing a lot. Trump wants to put USAID into the State Department and have it operate under one budget, right? You know, we may not spend our money wisely all the time, but every now and then we get it right, you know, and, and it's a question of, of guns or butter. You know, are we going to be helping the, the economics of the world get to the place where wars are unnecessary? I mean, look at what's happened with the European Union. How many wars between Germany and France before, before 1950? A thousand years? You know, under the European Union and under the NATO coalition, can you imagine a French-German conflict, you know, in the next hundred? You can't. The economic ties that intertwine countries that are economically connected and, and everybody's working together to raise their tides is the best defense that we've got, I think. So drastic government cut, head of U.S. defense. The head of U.S. at defense budget cuts. I don't know. And, and uh, also, State Department, 66 senior ambassadors uh, were cut from the State Department budget in the last two years. Uh, one of my friends, I went to Holy Cross as an undergraduate, one of my classmates uh, was the Director General of the Ambassador Corps. When I was doing work in the Philippines, he was the U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines. His name is Harry Thomas. You know, they tried to force him out last year. You know, he wanted to, to stay in. He's been, a, he's been an ambassador for over 30 years. He's a really smart, good guy. He's been in a lot of places, he's been in Pakistan, been in India, been in the Philippines, been significantly done really well. And he's black. Not too, we don't have many black ambassadors these days. So they said, well, you either take your pension or we'll send you to Africa. He said, <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't throw me in that briar patch. <laughs> and so now he's the ambassador to Zimbabwe. And he's very happy. He'll do his two years or three years in Zimbabwe and be very happy. But the, the, the disregard that the current administration has for highly experienced, educated people who can help, who can help, it, it's just amazing. Oh, then now take my last shot. I'm going a little bit over time here. Uh, walls of the world. I said in the beginning, some countries build windmills, some people build walls. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I'd just do a quick historical review of the success of walls of the world. <laughs> Jericho. You know, it didn't last very long. Yeah. And even though it's biblical, some people say this historical probability did exist. Hadrian's Wall, which is Hadrian is one of the last emperors of Rome who decided to try to keep the barbarians out by building a wall across northern Europe. You can still see some remains of the wall. They go through northern Germany, not too far from Frankfurt. If you've ever got they call it the Romish you know, Wall. You have the Romish Wall. You know, and I'm thinking the barbarians must have been really short. <laughs> because that wall only comes up about this high. You know, Great Wall of China took them 300 years to build, and the Mongolians waved at it as they, they rode by. You know, it never stopped anybody from doing anything. Do you remember any, any veterans here of World War II, World War I? The Maginot Line? That was France's defense wall to keep the Germans out of France. Uh, and it didn't, it lasted a day, less than a day. Less than a day. 
Hitler's coastal defenses, the Atlantic Wall. Can you spell D-Day? <laughs> Didn't work. The Berlin Wall lasted actually longer than most, you know, but eventually came down. Eventually, they <coughs> Um, one of the, the, the real terrific walls, I mean terrible walls, terrific in the horrible sense of the word terrific, the West Bank walls that separates Palestine from Israel, or separates in some sense the Palestines from their homeland, depending on how you look at it, and the Mexican border wall, you know, the great, that we started in 1994. So, so remember there was about $28 billion that they cut from the State Department budget, right, now hold that figure in your head. So this is the proposed Trump wall, the, 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 brown, the black wall. It's going to protect us from the invasion of those terrible Mexicans. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and uh, this is the estimates of what it will cost to build that wall. So the total length of the border is, you know, uh, almost 2,000 miles. We need to build 1,000 miles of wall at 40 feet high. The concrete needed $711 million. Cement needed $240 million. Our estimated. By the way, these are not. These these are not. Uh, these are true facts. <laughs> these are not made up facts. These are made out of the Economist magazine, which is a fairly reputable source of information. They don't fool around. So they're estimating between 15 billion to 25 billion to build a wall, and Trump says, "No, no, we can do it for 12, because I'm one of the great negotiators, and, and I can get the cost down." So so instead of spending money on foreign aid, on direct aid, on building up our dipl diplomatic capacity, especially in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, which we're not, we don't have a good presence, we're going to be spending money on building up, protecting us from the invasion of the Mexicans. Hey, but Mexico's going to pay for this. Uh, of course. <laughs> well, they actually, they, they, they put out a lot of bids for the wall, yeah. and, and it looks like we have the winning bidder, and I'm going to show you who won the bid. Well, not the Great Wall. <laughs> they didn't win. Didn't work. It's a beautiful architectural phenomenon. It's great. Yeah. But IKEA put in a build for the wall. <laughs> <laughs> the only way we're going to build it for eleven million dollars is if we build it ourselves. So they're going to be the border wall. You know. <laughs> That's how it's going to go. Okay. So. Uh, why did I tell you this, and why am I concerned? In the last election, uh, on average, in every election since 1980, only 43% of the people who can vote do vote, right? Uh, and, and that's an advertisement for, for that ISIS and all of the countries that hate us use. Yes, you have a democracy. Yes, you can vote, but you don't. You don't exercise that privilege. And, and so they use it as, as propaganda against us. So, so Jefferson knew, we in America do not have the government by the majority, we have the, the government by the majority who participate. And if you don't vote, you don't participate. And I don't care who you vote for, you know? It doesn't matter to me who you vote for, but it matters to me that you vote. In fact, I, 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 Tom introduced me to, to Pat Leahy last year, to Senator Leahy, and I met with him, and I, I made a proposal to him and anybody who listened to me for more than five minutes <laughs> that we should change our national voting day from the second, from the first Tuesday in November to Veterans Day. I think we should vote on Veterans Day. In almost every country of the world, democratic country of the world, voting day is a national holiday, and that's why they have a high percentage of people who vote. It's a duty. It's an obligation. In France, you are penalized if you don't vote. You know. Liberty, egalite, fraternity, you know, it's important. So why not make Veterans Day, when we honor the people who died so we could vote, why don't we make that a national holiday, and make it a national voting day? It doesn't have to be every year. Once every four years, we declare voting day, Veterans Day a national holiday, so we can all get out and vote and, and increase our numbers from 43%. Because if you look at the current figures and ana analytics about how the current regime got into place, it wasn't because of the people who voted for or against either of the incumbents. It was a number of people who didn't vote. The Hispanics didn't vote. They stayed home. You know, a large number of people couldn't choose, couldn't decide which of the two very unpopular candidates, doesn't matter which party you're from, you know, to vote for. So they didn't vote. So it was the people who stayed home why we're here. So, so I, I, I'm a strong advocate for saying we need, we need to vote, you need to vote, 
we need to get out and vote. We need to encourage everybody to vote. Because the best way that we can remain, uh, you know, the leader of the free world is to get out there and exercise our freedoms and make sure the world knows about it. So, uh, that's what I have to say. That's why I do this, because I think there's something going on 8,000 miles away that most people don't know about that should give you some motivation to rethink what you're doing. So, so I'm, I'm here for as long as you have questions. So if you have questions, I'm glad to answer. And by the way, I also speak Korean, and, and I know Korea. Tim knows Korea. So, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim, environmental crisis. I've read, many of us have read that Bangladesh, for example, can expect 100 million people displaced because of rising sea levels. Um, that's just one of several countries that are going to be impacted by yeah. r rising sea levels and global warming. How is China um, planning for the future, planning for these environmental crises? Uh, several ways. First of all, they're now the world leader in solar energy and alternative energy. You know, uh, most of your solar panels, if you're putting up solar panels here, and they're not made in the USA, they're made in China. You know, and, and, and our current leadership made a conscious decision not to fund alternative energy and to fund, you know, anthracite coal. And there's even, Scott Pruitt last week proposed a new rule that would guarantee that certain coal-fired plants that are current operation must be maintained in operation and cannot be closed down for at least 10 years. So, so in terms of environmental sensitivity and marts energy, that's one way. They're really trying very hard to, to become the world leader in all kinds of alternative energy. Like I said before, 50% of all the electric vehicles in the world now are sold in China to Chinese. And by 2025, all the coastal cities, Beijing, Tianjin, <coughs> Shenzhen, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, will all be only electric vehicles. So that's one way. In terms of, they have great exposure you know, because of their, the vast majority of the population is in the coastal cities. And, and part of the reason they're increasing the development of their transportation internally is to be able to quickly move the populations in. You know? and, and they can do it. By the way, in, in, uh, in New Year's holiday, which it, in, in, it's, a, it's a combination of Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's combined. It's a 10-day vacation in China. It happens in the Lunar New Year. There are 1.4 billion people in China, and virtually everybody goes home. In that one period of time, last year, 800 million people traveled in that 10-day period. So over two-thirds of the population traveled in a 10-day period. So they, and they, they can move them. They can move them. You know? I, I, it's funny, because in, in Shanghai, they have terrible traffic and doesn't go anywhere very fast. So I used to ride the subway because it was air conditioned and it was fast. It, getting in a car was like, it could be an hour, it could be two hours to get across the city. You can literally walk across the tops of cars to get across the street because pedestrian does not have the right of way in China. You know, you are at war with a moving vehicle. But it, it, during that 10 day period, Shanghai was empty. I could walk across the highway you know, to get to where I needed to go during the, the, the what they call the Spring Festival. So yes, they can move people very quickly, very fast. How diverse is the Chinese culture? Ninety percent of the Chinese population are what, are what they call Han Chinese. Han are, are the, you know, uh, not a pure race, but a relatively pure race. They're called Han Chinese. There are 55 minorities, you know, within China who comprise the other 10% of the Chinese population. Now, the challenge to the Chinese are, the Han Chinese, which comprise most of the government, is that those 55 minorities control 60% of the geography of China, and that 60% is where the natural resources that China needs to develop are. So, for example, the Uyghur population, the Muslim population, which is, you know, the, the, where, where China becomes you know, the Silk Road where it meets the population, is it, they're very sensitive to that, not necessarily because they fear a mass uprising of the Uyghurs, but they're sensitive to the fact that they control a very valuable part of Chinese geography. So again, 55 minorities, 10% of the population controls 60% of the geographic area of China. So that's where their sensitivity is. They control the natural resources. And, and, and what China does when they take over something 
is they, they, they do it by assimilation. Uh, there's a city in, in northwestern China right on the Silk Road, uh, Ningxia, you know, and what the Chinese have done, have moved, provided incentives for mass numbers of Han Chinese to move ever, to move there and intermarry, you know, with the local populations. They've done it in Tibet. Whenever they move into an area that they think is sensitive, they move Han Chinese in and they intermarry. And so you can go to Ningxia today and see people who appear to be Persian or Arabic or Caucasian speaking fluent Chinese. You know, it's a little bit disconcerting at first when you see that. But um, they're becoming more diverse, but 90% Han is pretty monolithic, I think. Yes? Demographics. Yes. Uh, both aging and uh, gender. Are these issues? Uh, huge issues. They have the same problems that we do for the most part. They have an Asian population uh, with not enough people paying either their national health system, their social security, to fund everybody. Even with a one-child policy, you know, that one child has two parents and four grandparents that he's going to have to take care of because the second value, you know, after group uh, harmony is filial duty, that you're expected to take care of your parents. And the reason the Chinese got away with a weak national health system was because the family system was so strong. But with the development and the movement and the migration of the Chinese, not everybody lives in the same place for a thousand years anymore. So the families have broken down to a certain extent. And so the government has to step in and provide some kind of support because the national economic health of China is depending on their ability to become manufacturing, artificial intelligence, supercomputer, you take it. They need to have these mass concentrations to, to supply the economic development of China. So the government is having to step in so last year they took out the, the one child policy and now you can have two children. The problem is, the problem is that the, and the, one, we, the, one of the factories where we had, that I I've worked at and lived with for a long time, the women there, you know, have their first child. They don't, they don't get married until late twenties for the most part. They have one child and that's it. And they've got one child and two parents and four grandparents. Life is pretty good for a woman <laughs> of child-rearing age in China, you know. Uh, and so they're not that anxious to have a second child because they like their careers, they like their income, they like their life, you know, and now they've had at least two generations of single child, and so none of them are standing in line to have a second child. And the males can't well, find, you are is that a... Oh, well, yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. <coughs> the males, uh, you know, during this one, not so much now, but there used to be a problem, you know, if you only have one child, you know, the, the Confucian and the Buddhist ethic would say you have to have a male child to carry on the family name. So, you know, female children were either given away or they got lost, is the, the variation of the Chinese expression. It says in Chinese, I mean, they got lost. Uh, and so there are now more men than women. And so now, women pretty much have the pick of the litter as they say. They can marry whoever they want. And, and for a young, middle-class Chinese man, you have to have a good job, you have to have a car, and you have to have an apartment to even be considered marriageable, you know. So, and, and, and you know, the, the guys, it, it, it's funny, you see a guy like, who looks not unlike Kim Jong-un, with a dazzlingly beautiful Chinese wife, and you say, that guy has a lot of money. <laughs> you know, he's got the prerequisites to, to marry well. So it is a problem. And what they're starting to do now is import, um, you know, uh, Thai, Vietnamese, Cambodian wives, you know, and bring them into the system. And they're saying, well, in the old times, that was part of the Chinese empire anyway. <laughs> so the genes aren't that different. Yeah. So the Chinese have a way of holding, you know, we have an analytical Western mentality where it's either black or white or, you know, or green or yellow or this or that. Chinese don't have that. They have this yin-yang. It's, you know, two sides of the same corn. They have no problem holding two very different thoughts in their mind at the same time and not having any problem with that. You know, it's, it's a very different way of looking at the world. It's charming, by the way, at some points, but disturbing in others. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Yes. Howard? A couple of minor points or minor questions. First about that slide, 
Yep. The golden age of motor turnout in the United States was the decades after the Civil War, when it was uh, 70 to 80 percent. In our first election under the Constitution in 1789, the turnout was 8 percent. Amazing, but true. Uh, concerning uh, China, we look at China on the map, and China looks small because it's next to Russia. But actually, in terms of land area, uh, China is smaller than Canada and larger than the United States. Yeah. And then Brazil comes next. The minor question is concerning the, uh, the, the railway that just went by there. Yeah. Have they standardized the rail gauges yet? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You go, there are, there are now 12,000 miles of high-speed rail. Well, on, on, on a standard gauge. On the standard gauge, yes. It, it used to be they had to trench ship uh, several times because of the change in gauges. Yeah. No, for that train that went to to uh, to London, they had to change the engine several times because of the different electrification, non-electrification. But it was on a standard gauge, and they mm -hmm. built that on purpose. Now, as I said before, the Chinese are very good at huge scale projects, mm -hmm. but they're not very good at what they call the last mile. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by the last mile is when I lived in Hangzhou, we lived in a very modern apartment building in a very modern part of the city on the university campus. And, and everything was wonderful, except couldn't drink the water. You know, and and uh, so there was a, a purified water station like you find at Whole Foods or the Co-op in the center of the the apartment courtyard, and you went out there. You, we had these huge bottles, you know, that you'd fill up for your drinking and cooking water. You could bathe in the water; that was fine, but you wouldn't want to cook in it. So they could deliver water to 1.4 billion people, you just couldn't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's why they built the Three Gorges Dam for drinking water and for hydroelectric. So again, satellite projects. Yes? Going into the economics of it, um, I mean, China has its, for the good of all, mentality and yeah. ethic. And the U.S. has every person out for themselves. Yes. And, I mean, just how does capitalism play into this? Okay. It's very and, interesting. And the, Okay. Is this the collapse of the, capitalism? The, or? No, no. The communism of <coughs> Chinese communism is not Marxism. It's not Leninism. Trotsky wouldn't wouldn't believe it. You know. But what they've done is what they do with almost anything is they've taken a concept and made it Chinese. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's really a socialized capitalism. And and they have a very interesting way of doing government dictums. You know, when they when the government speaks from on high, they don't give direct, you know, specific. Directions. For example, when Deng Xiaoping opened up the um, the country to capitalism for the first time, it said it's okay, you know, to make money individually. So they provided incentives, and there are a lot of pretty sharp Chinese capitalists who live within the socialist system. Uh, and he said they asked him, "How are we going to become more capitalistic in our growth?" And he said, uh, "We will cross the river by finding the stones." <laughs> and that was. They all interpreted that as, okay, we'll just go out and experiment until we figure out what works. And then they said, well, what about, what happens if we get rich, you know, and we become capitalists? Won't that defeat the communist system? And Deng Xiaoping said, in his inimitable style, uh, black cat, white cat, whoever catches the mouse. <laughs> yeah. And the Chinese understood that completely you know, as, as permission, you know, to go out there and make money. So if it... It, just in Shanghai itself, you know, I saw more Prada stores and more Lamborghini dealerships, you know, uh, than I, I've never seen. I've never seen a Lamborghini dealership until I went to Shanghai. You know, maybe they have one in New York. I've never gone there, but they're, they are very. The the middle class is very well off, and the upper class now is very rich, and so they are spending money. And what China is doing now is they're pivoting from being a contract manufacturer to the world to being a manufacturer to domestic. Because now the middle class has enough money uh, and, and they want to spend it locally and China wants to keep the money internally. So, so um, this problem of tariffs and whatever is not going to stop the Chinese at all. And by the way, they only, only 3%, they only, we only import 3% of our steel from China. So the tariffs are going to have virtually no effect on our business with China. Also, how does the, the U.S., with its increasingly 
free market mentality. Capitalism. I'm sorry, free market? Free market, <laughs> in the sense of libertarianism. Oh, well. Um, how does that fit in as a counterbalance to China? I mean, it's it, it, well, it's, it, it, it's almost to the point of it doesn't matter. Because, because however much the libertarians are railing against the current government, Trumpism is not libertarianism. No. And, and, and he's certainly building walls and putting on tariffs and shutting down trade, et cetera. I mean, the, the libertarians must be just freaking out, you know, by what's going on these days. The, the, uh, the Chinese believe in free markets. You know, they, they, they're protectionists to a certain extent, just the way that we are. There are certain industries they want to protect. You know, I mean, the Canada protects its dairy. Well, we certainly protect ours. And if you're from Vermont, you should know that. You know, we have all kinds of price protections for the dairy that comes out of Vermont. But um, it's just a very different way. Of, and when, when you're talking about 1.4 billion people versus 300 million people or 350 million people, the scale at which they operate, I mean, we're just toe jam to them, really, for the most part, is some of the things that we worry about. And, and just today, uh, if you've read the paper, there are two Chinese pharmaceutical companies just opened up, or are about to open up, in, in Kendall Square, just outside MIT. Mm -hmm. And Genworth was recently purchased by the Chinese. Yes, company. yeah. Right. And, and, and some of the great soccer teams that, you know, of the world are now owned by Chinese. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> you know. So uh, we, we can't, you can't fight them. <laughs> There's just no way we can fight them. Yes, Andy. Jim, um, I have heard, and I not in any great detail, that the Chinese, one of the reasons that the Chinese have been investing in Africa is that they can farm it. They yes. have a hell of a lot of people to feed. Yeah. And although there's a lot of space in China, it isn't that much. Mm -hmm. How, what are they doing to increase the, the agriculture and the ability to feed the Chinese within China? Yeah. And what other parts of the world are they planning to farm? Well, it's not so much that they're planning to farm, it's that they're importing goods. I mean, 50% of our soybeans, until recently, mm -hmm. you know, went to China. The American farmers, I mean, China was very selective in, in the tariffs that it put on. Well, we're putting on tariffs to Chinese steel and aluminum, 3% imports. You know, China was very specific in going after Iowa and going after the Midwest. By the way, the current U.S. ambassador to China was the former governor of Iowa, so they hit right in his bread basket, so to speak. 50% of our soybean exports go to China. So China says, are you going to put 25%? Okay, we got to deal with Australia. we got to deal with Brazil. It's okay by us. You know, we, We're acting as if we are the only source. And there may have been a time when that was true, but it's no longer true. Yeah. The, the rest of the world is catching up. So we are not the dominant player in many of the markets. And there are alternative markets. So it's it, it's scary, but you can't you can't keep fighting. You know, in, in I have a business degree, and one of the things that you learn in business is that when growth covers a lot of sins, right? But when growth starts to level off, and your growth starts to level off, and the United States now is in a virtually no growth economy, we're just barely growing, you know, some of our weaknesses start to be exposed, they can be exploited, you know, and, and a lot of our companies that, you know, that Trump wants to protect are already in China trying to do business with the Chinese. And they talk about the intellectual property protections, you know, and the Chinese are, are, you know, trying to steal our intellectual property. Do you remember what the Japanese did in the 1970s in the auto industry? You know, when the Chinese were actively touring Detroit and, and all those places, and, and we made this plant where we built cars together, a Saturn vehicle in California, this joint <laughs> operation between Toyota and GM. What, what do you think they were doing with the technology? You know. Every developing country, they go through, you know, Japan learned from us, you know, Edward Stemming and quality control and all that. We taught them how to do what they did. You know, the Japanese started to outsource to Korea. Korea said, okay, we'll be the, your contract manufacturer for a while. And then the Koreans figured out how to do it, right? And now the, then they outsourced to China, and China, you know, learned how to do it because we built factories, the Chinese built, the Koreans built factories. They're not stupid. You know, you, you're going to invite me in and build your factory. I'm going to pay attention to what you're doing. And then I'll become the competition to you. And now what the Chinese government is doing is encouraging them to turn and now uh, stop developing for export to develop for internal consumption. So what they're talking about is not different. It depends on how you do it. Apple, how many of you have an Apple phone? All of your Apple phones were built and assembled in China. Right. Apple has no problem 
with intellectual property in China. Why? Because they're smart. Because they change the Apple phone faster than the Chinese can copy it. <laughs> right? No, I'm serious. They do. You know, the, the big one of the biggest auto manufacturers, ex importers in China, is, is VW. Mm -hmm. If you go to Shanghai or Beijing or Hong Kong or Guangzhou, 90% of the tax taxes are VWs. But they're not VWs that you can buy anywhere else in the world. Do you remember your old Jetta Fox? You know, they're, they're, they're all kind of squarish looking, you know, Volkswagens, you know. And Volkswagen didn't, didn't introduce its latest model vehicles into China. They didn't introduce its latest technology. They resurrected an older, very efficient, very effective automobile that you know, can run for 200,000 miles. You know, you know, the old VWs never changed their design. And they're, so they're making billions of dollars selling resurrected vehicles in China. And the, and the, the Germans don't care if you copy. Because they're not going to sell that vehicle anywhere else in the world because we're se seven generations ahead in terms of vehicles. So if you're going to get into that market, you have to be smart. Home Depot tried to enter the, the, the Chinese market 10 years ago and failed miserably. Why? What's the, what's the premise of Home Depot? Do it yourself. Right? Labor is so cheap in China, nobody does it themselves. <laughs> they hire somebody else to do it. The business model didn't work. And so, well, you know, Home Depot was, didn't work any better there than it worked over here by Hennifer. <laughs> Just got one, yeah. one other question, and that sure. is, for historical reasons, emotional reasons, yeah. Taiwan is very important to China. Sure. Is it relevant today? Is it... I mean, it's this little island, and China is so big, and they're doing such amazing things. It's symbolic to China. It's symbolic. Symbolism is a big deal in in almost anywhere you go in Asia, yeah. and and the fact that it's a renegade island, it, it's where the, the history of it is. For those of you who are not as familiar, when when after the Japanese were kicked out of China, and and there were two opposing factions, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communists, and Chiang Kai-shek, you know, and, the, and the, the National Party, the Kuomintang, you know, they went after each other, and Mao Zedong essentially won and forced Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan. So it's, it's been the, the opposition party, you know, to the Chinese Communist Party, you know, since 1949, since Mao Zedong established the new China. And so historically, you know, the Chinese care a lot about you know, the fact that Taiwan exists, the same way they, they wanted to get Hong Kong back. So they tolerate Taiwan, but they're very sensitive mm -hmm. because of its um, history in relation to the development of the new China. So, uh, they, they don't mess. Yeah. Yes, Howard? Um, first, referencing uh, this week's economist, uh, actually, uh, our, our growth in our growth rate, GDP, and industrial production are quite healthy. But the point is that China is what China's are twice ours. Sure. GDP and uh, industrial production. But the other thing is, referencing last week's economists, uh, the Indian Ocean area of your map there. There's a very similar map in there where there's a bunch of other dots, which is other countries, Saudi Arabia yeah. as an example, who are uh, active in the area, you know, outside their own uh, yeah. outside their own countries. Are you able to speak about that a bit? Who else is competing there? Well, we are competing there, you know, uh, but the point is if you look at just proximity and, and uh, willingness to invest resources, you know, we're cutting our foreign aid, we're cutting our contributions to the IMF or the World Bank, you know, we're pulling back to um, Fortress America, you know, and China is, is increasing its spending. You know, I, I think I showed you the GDP. We spend on average we, 2 percent, 3 percent for infrastructure development. China's spending, you know, 7 to 9 percent on infrastructure development. And China, by the way, is the second largest economy in the world. That's a lot of dollars. That's a lot of money. To clarify my question, there are other players in the game. Yeah. What about them? They're, they just don't have this, the scope and the resources to do it. I mean, the Saudis, there's a, there are only 3 million Saudis in the world. And, and, and so they just don't have the population to do it. Anything you want to get done, I, used to, I, I worked on a project in Saudi Arabia a long time ago. And, and uh, what ha because there are only three million Saudis, you know, native-born Saudis in the world, they're very dependent upon other people to do all the work for them. 
if you go to Saudi Arabia, there's Pakistanis and Filipinos and Indians who all do uh, skilled labor and even educated labor. They just inhabit the infrastructure. Saudis essentially don't have to work. So when Saudis are, are investing in other countries, they're not sending Saudis out to do the work. They're hiring Pakistanis and Filipinos and Indians to do the work for them. Mm -hmm. so, so they just don't have the resources, either natural resources or human resources, to be able to populate the scale of projects that the Chinese are doing in those countries. What they do have, of course, uh, around the Persian Gulf, except for Iraq and Iran, those countries have pretty, uh, pretty valuable sovereign wealth funds. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how they compare in terms of the amount of money China has. Do you? Yeah, not much. Mm -hmm. Not much. I mean, it, it, we don't have the kind of money that China has right now. You know who the biggest holder of our debt is in the world? Mm -hmm. yeah. China. They own 7% of our national debt. You know, and they're second, I think, behind Japan. They finance, they finance our budgetary deficit, federal budgetary deficit. Yeah. So, and, and the scary part about us is if we, if we start pushing hard on the tariffs, the Chinese can just flood the world with American dollars and drive down the, you know, we, we, we get into inflation virtually overnight. I, I, I just wonder, you know, if, if the guy in the White House thinks about that occasionally. No. No. You know, uh, so if, 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 if I was a company, if I was a private company, and I own 7% of your stock, I'd have a seat on your board. You'd have to deal with me. You know, I would be almost a majority shareholder. You know, not a majority, but a poor shareholder. You'd have to. I'd be. I'd be on your on your board. In fact, I might compete to be a board to be the chairman of the board. So, again, don't don't feel like you have to say. If you want to stay and talk, fine. If you need to go, go. It's, I'm over time now. I, I appreciate that you came. Thank you for coming. And I'm always surprised that people don't walk out earlier. <laughs>